Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very biased collection. That's why I'm here, because I'm biased. Um, anyway, um, so I'm kind of continuing, not kind of, I'm continuing with the Millennium Surprise problems. And there are only two to go at this point. And this one is, well, it's called the Hodge Conjecture. And I feel like it's the most difficult one to motivate. So if you collect problems in uh, mathematics and you need to make a list of seven of them, then obviously there will be some bias in your story and you, some fields will be underrepresented, some fields will be overrepresented. And this one turns out to be the most abstract problem on the list, at least in my opinion. And it just doesn't mean it's it's bad or good, it's just, it usually just means it's difficult to explain because I kind of need to assume a certain system amount of background. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. But this one is really at the intersection, really at the intersection of kind of topology and classical topology and classical algebraic geometry. Uh, it's a kind of caveat that, that what I call classical algebraic geometry is probably modern algebraic geometry. But modern is, it, it was modern in the 50s. Anyway, I should, should stop grappling about the difference between classical algebraic geometry and modern algebraic geometry. Anyway, um, that's not really my problem with the, with the conjecture. I feel also personally feel it's the weakest uh, conjecture on the list for a reason I will come back to later. Uh, weakest, in, again, mean doesn't mean it's good or bad. I like them all. I like you all. Ah, oh, undiscriminate love. I like you all. Um, but it's kind of the weakest in a certain sense, and we come back to that later. But let's me try to motivate it. So topology meets geometry. So in topology, what topologists really study, it's kind of really, really strange. If you look at the what, what is taught in, in, in university, most people think topology is something like set-based topology, what, when it's really not. It's really about manifolds, actually. So uh, manifolds are the key objects in topology. And yeah, what is a manifold? A sphere. If you haven't seen a manifold, a sphere is a manifold. Your pair of pens is a manifold. A uh, torus is a manifold. A donut is a manifold. Uh, something like that. So people like to study these things that are locally made out of disks. Let me draw a local disk here uh, onto my space because disks are easy, but you still have the flexibility of how to glue those disks together. You should think about the kind of patchwork, uh, kind of patchwork thing. Um, it's a key object in topology. Right? Topology really studies manifolds. Not topological spaces, that's a mis misconception. It really studies manifolds. Topological spaces are just too wild. There's not much you can say about topological spaces in general. Um, what geometry, so algebraic geometry in particular, likes to study are varieties. And maybe again, the set of varieties is a bit, is a bit too wild. So let's say we are studying projects so of manifolds or topology. Let's say we study projective variety. And these are kind of zero sets of polynomials. So here, um, a zero set of a polynomial would be a circle, for example. It's a nice zero set of a polynomial because the polynomial you have is something like x squared plus y squared minus one. Right? So x squared plus y squared equal one would be the circle, and x squared plus minus plus x squared plus y squared minus one, the zero set of that would be the circle. And there are now key objects in geometry, and maybe I should get my uh, coloring set. And what happens if you put them together? That's what you do in mathematics all the time. You have a key object in, in one setting, and you have a key object in another setting. You just put them together, and you study projective manifolds. That's what they're called. And to make our life not completely insane. Uh, so it turns out that the complex numbers are the easiest ones. So let's study the ones that are defined with a complex structure, so complex projective manifolds, which up to this point of specifying a field, forget that. It's really just you take two notions, manifold and a projective space, if you want a projective variety, put them together, and you get those, those things. And then you can try to say something about them. They should be reasonably nice because they're nice from the viewpoint of topology but they're also nice from the viewpoint of geometry. How that makes some sense, right? They should be nice because they are nice in two different universes, if you want. All right, and what topologists does, topology does, topologists do, I guess. Um, so classical, as I said, they study something like homology. Homology is one of the, the key inventions of the last century, in mathematics at least. Um, so they study homology, so you would throw your homology on your space and you would try to compute it. So for example, if X is a manifold, homology really what it is, it kind of counts sub-manifolds. That's really what it is. It's a graded space, 
And in, in every grading piece, you have a certain core dimension submenu for it. So if you think of, or, or dimension depends a bit whether you want to do homology or cohomology, it doesn't really matter. So I, I'm using cohomology because, uh, well, actually the conjecture itself is stated in terms of cohomology. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. So let, let's, let's, let's ignore the technical differences here. Anyway, so uh, homology, for example, you want to do it for the, for the swim ring, the little torus here, um, then there should be a component for the torus itself uh, in highest dimension. There should be a component for a point in lowest dimension. And then there are two sub-manifolds of kind of the intermediate dimension of dimension one. One of them runs around like A and the other one runs around like B. And indeed, that's what the homology is. So homology in the setup of this video, at least, in some nice cases, homology is really just counting submanifolds. And for the torus, we have submanifolds up to some equivalents, and there's a point, there's A, B, and the torus, and that is uh, what the homology what the homology does. So that's what topologists do. They kind of take a manifold and they try to hook up an algebraic object. It's called homology, where you kind of associate um, kind of nice algebraic symbols to submanifolds. Manifold is your main, main notion. Submanifold is what we would study as a subspace. Hope it makes some sense. Algebraists do the same, but they replace manifold by variety because that's what algebraists do. They study zero sets of polynomials, right? So they should set a manifold. You should look at a variety. So it's kind of the same, and the corresponding object it has kind of goes with the many names. I know it as a name intersection ring, Chow ring, or Chow group. And there are probably even more names for that guy. But anyway, it's really the same as homology, but now it should count sub-varieties, right? So here we count sub-manifolds, and here we count sub-varieties. Uh, looks like the same. Homology is super great, super powerful, super fantastic. That's what you would do. That's what you would write down as an algebraic geometer. Turns out that this is a really shitty definition in some sense. I shouldn't have said that. Let me say it again. I shouldn't have said that, so let me say it again. It's a really shitty definition in the sense that um, variety is a two wide class. So you should expect the shower group. So tomology kind of easy, nice, usually very finite, very nice, beautiful structure. Shower group, you should expect it to be like large, like, like really uncontrollable, large, that oh, they're terrible in some sense. Um, so definition, it's what he would do. I totally, I, I totally agree. That's a fantastic definition. If you know homology, that's what you would do as an algebraic geometer. Turns out, for practical purposes, it's like really difficult. They're notoriously difficult. Uh, Chow groups, co computing them even for easier spaces is like ah, very, very difficult. They're usually huge and they have mysterious structures and oh, but really difficult. But that's what an um, algebraic geometer would do, right? Topologists would count sub manifolds, algebraic geometer would count sub varieties. So if you have something now that is both, where you can play both games, then you should expect, maybe one could expect a relationship between the sub manifolds and the sub varieties. That must be a really weight relation because manifold is really restrictive. Variety is way too vast in some sense. So maybe there should be something like I can express my manifolds in terms of varieties in a certain type of sense in a quite vague sense, uh, not in a very precise sense, but in a uh, weak sense. So um, you shouldn't hope for too much because the Chow ring is just, the Chow group is just too crazy. And this is where the Hodge conjecture jumps in. Essentially, it's a conjecture about how the two are related. And the point is not uh, the observation that the two did, uh, well, this is natural to write down, that's what I'm trying to sell here because the, the precise statement is a bit difficult. Of course, the precise statement is the whole gem of the conjecture and not so much that there is some relationship between the two or one should study the relationship between the two. But it's not completely straightforward to write it down, but it's not so difficult if you uh, accept a certain thing. So we take our complex projective manifold here and we, let's say, because it's complex, there will be some even dimension over the real numbers. And we're always interested in kind of the half dimension because that's kind of the interest. If you think of a binomial, if you think of the binomial, right? The interesting part for the binomial happens roughly in the middle. And so here it's kind of the same. So the interesting story happens in the, for the middle dimensional manifolds, um, submanifolds. So we take the middle dimension. So 2n, the real dimension of our x, n is the middle dimension. 
And it turns out that it can, you have this so-called Hodge filtration on the middle dimension where I can write down uh, the middle cohomology in terms of those guys, whatever they are. And essentially what you want to say is that these guys here, the Hodge classes, which essentially should be our middle dimensional guys, but we restrict them a little bit by cutting them down um, over, uh, well, by cutting them down is a slightly smaller space, but let's ignore that. Let's just say we want to count uh, how many of those middle dimensional things exist. And we call those Hodge classes. And what could be now the relationship? Well, you turn everything into groups. I should have said that. Homology is a group. So everything is actually a class. A manifold corresponds now to a group element, uh, an abelian group. Similar is a chow ring is an abelian group, chow group, that's what it is. Um, and so you could talk about, well, in order to avoid torsion, you go to a field. So let's go to the uh, complex, uh, complex numbers, Q, the rational numbers. And you can ask, is every manifold, submanifold, is every Hodge class, which is kind of a restricted class of submanifolds, is it a combination of sub varieties? So can you re remember that there are many more varieties than uh, manifolds, so it should go this way around. Uh, so, so which Hodge classes are linear combination of sub varieties? And the theorem I want to sell is that for K equals one, so something like uh, the, the, the two-dimensional space that we take uh, the one-dimensional ones, so really, uh, this type of picture here, if you want, uh, so the middle things, actually it's true. And that's also difficult to show, and it was known before Hodge, the Hodge conjecture came out, was kind of the motivation uh, for the Hodge conjecture. And the millennium surprise problem is to so, so show the same for all the K, right? higher dimensional spaces, and is every sub, is every submanifold, uh, uh, is every submanifold expressible as a sub right? Again, keeping in mind that there are more sub varieties than sub -made. So for the Riemann sphere, for example, the conjecture is true because it turns out for the Riemann sphere, the cohomology is the same as the Chow group. Uh, yeah, so there's not much to say in this case, but in general, it gets uh, much, 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 much more difficult. And this is essentially also my problem with the conjecture. I think it's very natural as an algebraic geometer and as a topologist, you eventually will write down some form of this conjecture. Um, but again, the proof is at the pudding, if you want. The, the real point is the precise formulation of the conjecture, which I kind of, which I have on the slide, uh, but I kind of not really talking about it because it's not super easy to explain. But anyway, so there are some subtleties involved. So for example, you take rational coefficients, uh, not integers, because torsion is difficult. You have complex manifolds, not arbitrary manifolds, because it's again difficult. You need to restrict your classes to the Hodge classes but otherwise it's wrong, and so on and so on. But what I really kind of, but what I feel like this is the weakest conjecture on the list of millennium's problems is it is the least verified in some sense. So if you think about the Riemann hypothesis, computer verified up to back, God knows how many, uh, God knows how big zeros on the on the critical strip. Uh, the Bishman dia conjecture is a computer born conjecture. Um, the Navier Stokes numerical solutions can be easily constructed and, and so on. So all of them have all of the other ones. So for, also for the Poincaré conjecture, which is now a theorem, there was a lot of evidence that it should be true. And I feel like this one is really the weakest. So where to place such conjecture is not so quite clear to me. Um, let me just say it this way. I don't think it's wrong. It, it stood for a long time, but also not too many people are working on it. So algebraic geometers tend to focus on other problems right now. Eventually, they probably will come back to the Hodge conjecture. But anyway, it kind of I kind of feel like if someone would tell me the Hodge conjecture needs to be corrected, there are some subtleties somewhere, and we need to cut it down a little bit, I wouldn't be very surprised. If someone would tell me the Riemann hypothesis needs to be corrected, I, I would be really surprised, actually. Um, anyway, um, so I kind of feel like this one is the weakest in the sense there's uh, least evidence. Um, yeah, so in mathematics is kind of really bad in defining what that means. So in other more kind of uh, real world studies, real world science, you have really a, a pyramid of how kind of how, um, how much evidence you have from expert opinion to systematic reviews. And somehow in, in mathematics, uh, what I would like to do is I would like to place a Hodge conjecture somewhere here in my pyramid, and I would probably place the Riemann hypothesis way much higher. That's, that's all I'm 
I'm trying to say. There is evidence. I link a really beautiful article in the in the description. Why should you believe uh, the Hodgkin lecture? But I feel like compared to the other ones, it's kind of not. It's a bit wonky, you know. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, as I said, I'm not saying it's wrong. Definitely not. Otherwise, I could write a paper. It's wrong. No, I can't do that. But I wouldn't be super surprised if I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone solved it. And I wouldn't be surprised if someone needs to fix it. I don't think it's wrong in that sense. I, I think that the class of varieties and the class of manifolds are pretty pretty wild, particularly in higher dimensions. And the, really, the only thing known is dimension one and four dimension one. And already for something like four and two, uh, it gets uh, it gets really tricky. That was a long waffle. I shouldn't have probably shouldn't have said that. I hope oh let me just say it again. I think. This one is the one with the least evidence because computations are like super, super difficult. And I would be really happy if someone could convince me otherwise that in some sense, in the sense that um, someone writes a nice computer program to do some calculations along those lines or something like that. I, I feel like this is really missing for the large conjecture in order uh, to make some progress. But anyway, ignore me. Some people who are much smarter than me and they put up those conjectures uh, for a good reason, so just ignore me. Um, but if you have some idea how to put it in a computer, I would be really, really happy to see that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.